Hello. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a wonderful and relaxing break. I hope it was as good as it could have possibly been. And I hope you're back ready to uh, learn some stuff about U.S. history. Today we're going to look at a continuation of the unit on the Cold War. Last time we went over the basics. We're going to continue on with a kind of thematic approach to the Cold War. And today uh, I want to talk about the theme of nuclear power. The nuclear age is essentially began with the end of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War. Uh, for If you're not familiar, for a little bit of a review, just wanted to talk about the process during World War II, which was a race to develop this most massive bomb that anyone had ever seen before, to actually harness the power that theoretical physicists had talked about in splitting the atom create a tremendous amount of energy. To try to harness that power, the United States recruited several scientists, including Albert Einstein, and uh, although he kind of conscientiously objected and didn't really move forward with the project, <clears throat> the project was really spearheaded by the scientist Robert Oppenheimer. And they ultimately did develop the atomic bomb after multiple tests, both in the deserts of Nevada and uh, New Mexico, places like that, and also in places where, unfortunately, there were indigenous people, places like uh, the Mariana Islands. Um, and of course, we did develop this weapon, and we did not shy away from using it. At the end of World War II, Germany had surrendered already in May of 1945. Uh, Adolf Hitler committed suicide with his girlfriend, Eva Braun, as the Allied forces were closing in on Berlin. But Japan was refusing to surrender. The United States was trying to get Japan to surrender, we had successfully surrounded Japan with our island hopping strategy um, and multiple victories in uh, the Pacific. But ultimately, Japan rejected our terms of surrender. They wanted to maintain the emperor as the legitimate ruler of their country, and the United States refused that term. Japan was offering terms of surrender to the Soviet Union, but President Truman thought that there was no alternative but a ground invasion or using the atomic bomb. Um, so instead of having a ground invasion where they predicted many hundreds of thousands might die, including tens of thousands, if not a hundred thousand Americans, uh, they opted instead to drop the atomic bomb, not once, but to demonstrate that we could build it again, we decided to drop it twice. So President Truman drops two atomic bombs on Japan, incinerates uh, I think it was 40,000 people in an instant in Hiroshima were incinerated and well over 150,000 people died uh, in total once you add up all the kind of after effects of the dropping of the atomic bombs. And this was obviously very controversial, and it still is very controversial. Uh, Japan has since never become a militaristic state as it was in the late 1800s and early 1900s. It has never aggressively invaded another country again and committed some of the atrocities like it did, as you saw in the documents in the Rape of Nanking. Um, so in some ways, maybe this was a successful military strategy, but of course, it was a horrifically violent strategy that has all kinds of catastrophic consequences, not just within the context of the war in those cities, but in the broader scheme of global politics, which let's talk a little bit about now. First of all, the distrust between America and the United States, we've already talked about a little bit, and the fact that we had developed the atomic bomb made Stalin even more suspicious of the United States. By 1949, the Soviet Union had tested its own atomic bomb, and now this triggered the ultimate arms race that lasts from the 1950s all the way through the 1980s. There were development of new weapons. By 1961, the Soviet Union blows up this bomb that is absolutely... Uh, incredibly powerful and way more powerful than what we dropped in World War II. And we have also developed basically space shuttle technology, which was developed in tandem with the nuclear program so as to be able to de deliver a nuclear bomb across oceans. This technology is called an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And we're also going to develop even missile defense systems that will occupy space that use satellites to try to shoot down nuclear weapons before they actually return to the Earth and drop on their target. Okay, so how does a modern thermonuclear weapon work? Well, it looks a little like this. 
So actually the missile part is, if I, if I go back to the last slide, the missile part is the shuttle, this part, that will actually deliver it overseas. The bomb is what's called the warhead, the part you put on top of the shuttle. And inside of it looks maybe something like this. There is essentially one bomb that goes off and it triggers a nuclear reaction in these very, very hard to get and very highly calibrated materials in the inner part of the bomb, uh, materials like uranium and plutonium, these materials of nuclear uh, power. And this actually compresses the secondary bomb and causes this splitting of the atom. It's, it's some version of that. I, I you know, don't know all the physics behind it. But it causes this massive, massive kind of explosion. And we managed to make more and more powerful versions of this bomb throughout the second half of the 20th century. So if you can look at the chart here, <clears throat> you will see the bombs dropped on Japan. Here is the 15 kiloton bomb. The first one dropped on Hiroshima. And the 21 kiloton bomb is the second one dropped on Nagasaki. Here they're comparing um, the height of Mount Everest with the actual height of the mushroom cloud explosions. Uh, a few years later, we have a one megaton bomb, <laughs> only to be surpassed by 15, and then eventually the hydrogen bomb, uh, the Tsar bomb, the 50 megaton bomb that Russia detonates in 1961. So you can see the magnitude of nuclear weapons today is so far beyond what it was, what was dropped in World War II, that we could destroy the world a hundred times over. Not to mention the fact uh, that the United States at, a, at its peak, I think had roughly 5,000 of these warheads and the Soviet Union had uh, more. And I, I think we may have even had more. We may have had close to 10,000 of these nuclear weapons at, at times in each stockpile. We have significantly reduced these stockpiles over uh, the last 25 years or so since the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, supposed end of the Cold War. Um, but this technology still exists. Here's how an ICBM works, by the way. So it will take off from one country or maybe from a nuclear submarine somewhere uh, floating around in, in the oceans, uh, but maybe from a silo in the middle of Kansas or something. And it actually is on a space shuttle. So it gets flown into space and you can see that much like a space shuttle the first fuel container will drop off and then once it gets into uh, I think this is up in the troposphere now it will detach and then it will actually deploy the warhead and the warhead will be on a trajectory to actually land to come back into orbit to come, not into orbit to come back into the atmosphere and land on its target across an ocean now, this is actually the technology that we weren't really sure if uh, some of the other countries that were afraid uh, that they're going to get nuclear weapons, if there are other countries that we fear them getting nuclear weapons because of their history of being aggressive and hostile, uh, but we never really thought that they had this intercontinental ballistic missile technology. Well, now we feel like North Korea probably does have the ability to strike across an ocean. <clears throat> so in the 1980s, originally, there was a defense system developed for this, and it actually works by literally shooting down the warhead in space. So you'd have to try to catch it. You can't launch a nuclear weapon without a radar system in the world detecting it. So the other country would know that the weapon is coming and would have a chance to respond. And there were two basic versions of this. We pushed the Strategic Defense Initiative in the 80s, and then eventually in the early 2000s, we had a huge uh, investment into the National Missile Defense System and it violated all kinds of treaties we had with Russia. Um, and the results were kind of controversial. Some people said that the system doesn't really work, whereas others swear that it really does. Um, we don't know. Thankfully, we've never had an all out nuclear war to be able to have to test these systems. But nuclear weapons definitely change foreign policy, how we deal with other nations completely. Uh, one really important term here is called mutually assured destruction. Uh, the fact that we have radar systems that could detect any kind of nuclear weapon launch guarantees that we could launch back before we actually get struck. So that means once you actually launch the weapon, you know that the retaliation is coming. And that tends to guarantee that you're not going to use them. This phenomenon is referred to as nuclear deterrence. So mutually assured destruction discourages the use of nuclear weapons. We know we're going to get shot back, so we just don't use them in the first place.
Now, in order to extend this nuclear deterrence over essentially the entire world, both the United States and the Soviet Union expanded what are called their nuclear umbrellas. And these were alliances that promised other nations in the world that if they were attacked with nuclear weapons, that the United States and the Soviet Union would defend them and respond in kind. Here we see the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. You can see all the original states in Western Europe joining up at the end of World War II in uh, the fear of Soviet aggression. And then later, uh, other countries were added, including former Soviet states after the Soviet Union basically dissolved. The response in 1955 was for the Soviet Union to consolidate with these other Eastern European countries, part of the Iron Curtain, in order to protect them against nuclear aggression as well. Now, one of the things that made this even more risky was the fact that the United States was willing, openly, to use nuclear force against aggressors and go to the brink of all-out nuclear war in order to maintain peace. Uh, this came pretty close to actual nuclear Armageddon in 1962 with the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we'll get into that in more detail, but I just wanted to go over some of the big thematic reflections. In one sense, mutually assured destruction has worked. We've never had an all-out nuclear war, and in fact, once the United States essentially outspent the Soviet Union in the 1980s, it's kind of complicated how the Cold War ends, but the United States spent the Soviet Union into the ground, and once the Soviet Union uh, dissolved, essentially we've had a pretty successful regime of global stability. We haven't had massive uh, nuclear conflict anywhere. Some other states have developed nuclear weapons, and that's definitely a concern. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but we haven't had that big all-out World War kind of conflict that we saw in World War I and World War II. And weapons of mass destruction actually play a big role in that. What we've seen, especially in the decline of the Cold War, is that conventional war, a war between two state militaries, is just way too costly today. There's too much destruction and too much is going to be lost, especially with globalized trade the way that it is today. So in a lot of ways, weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear weapons, and the other two kinds would be chemical weapons and biological weapons, chemical weapons being like mustard gas, like we saw in World War I, biological weapons would actually be weaponized diseases, things like that, pathogens, you know, trying to poison water supplies, things like that. Um, those kind of weapons make warfare way too costly today. And so what we've seen is what is called an unconventional or asymmetrical warfare, where usually the United States military or the Soviet military and not the Soviet, the Russian military today might be fighting against a loosely knit group of rebel groups like we see in Syria or we saw in Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, one of the aspects that some scholars talk about is that we tend to think of nuclear war as this event with a definite beginning and end. And some scholars say that that might over, overshadow some of the innocent victims of nuclear, the nuclear age. Nuclear weapons were tested in places where there were indigenous people uh, who didn't really have any kind of consent or say in this. Also, nuclear waste is stored in places like Native American sacred sites, and there's been a lot of controversy about that. Um, so there are other kinds of aspects to the whole nuclear age. There are other innocent victims that we don't even really see when we talk about the Cold War and, um, and the nuclear age. And of course, one of our concerns is the concept of nuclear proliferation. Proliferation means to grow and grow and grow. Um, and the concern is that nuclear weapons are continue, continuing to expand in which states actually have them. So today we have nuclear powers. Most of the big rich countries like Russia and China and the United States and Western Europe, European countries, most of them have nuclear weapons. We've also seen India and Pakistan develop nuclear weapons in the 1990s. Um, Iran has been a huge concern about developing nuclear weapons to the point where we had a huge agreement with them to try to prevent that, although the current uh, president administration has gone back on that deal. North Korea has developed nuclear weapons. It's a huge concern that they might become an aggressive power. So I'm curious about your opinion. I wonder about this question. Should we try to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons or do they make the world more safe? Post a reply and let me know your thoughts. 
All right, take care, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of the day.